Yo, yo, what is up? Welcome to the Realness Hotline. Guys, this is this is exciting for me. This is episode one of the Realness Hotline and um, something I've been wanting to do for a, for a while now. And we're finally making it happen. If you want to jump on the hotline, you can call 800-315-3218. And the reason I put this thing together was because I wanted your voice on the show. You know, I could take email questions or we have tons of questions that come through the Realness community, but there's just something about your sweet, sexy voice being on my show that it, it makes me it makes me tingle inside, and that's what that's more of what I want on the show, guys. We're coming up on the holidays. I mean, this this podcast is coming out on Black Friday, and you know, I feel like Black Friday ends up just exposing the true darkness of humanity at every retail outlet there is. I, I steer clear of malls. I steer clear of the internet. I feel like if I get too close to any of that, it's going to literally suck my soul out of my body and then use it to fuel the darkness within human consumerism. So I don't know if you're out there, if you're out there getting into this Black Friday madness, maybe you're sucked into your laptop just buying random shit that you may or may not need or things that people don't want so you can make them feel like you care about them, even though probably just a hug would suffice like a really genuine hug as opposed to some God knows what you got on Amazon. Maybe be thinking about that as you go through your black Friday and go into the holidays and something else that comes up in the holidays. And this is coming on us real quick. And you know, it's never good when something comes on you quick. Um, we got the holidays coming up. We're going to be around our families. And this is something that I struggled with for a long, long time, was just being around my family for an extended period of time. You know, and and something I want to share about a little bit before we jump into the calls is handling your family during the holidays. Because here's the thing, your mom's annoying and she's overbearing and she's a lot to deal with. I get it. That's probably never going to change. And maybe your brothers and sisters make you feel like shit. Maybe they're... Maybe they're stacking cash and you feel like you're driving around in an old Volkswagen and you don't have a girlfriend and you end up in these crazy ass weird relationships and and everybody's always asking you what your plan is and you really don't fucking know and you don't want people on your ass about it. You know, that's okay. I feel you. I've been there. And maybe you're the weird one in the family and the weird one in the family always has an interesting time going home for Christmas and going home for the holidays. And, you know, one thing I wanted to share is, is, uh, my experience with my my family. I've always been a little bit of the outsider. I've moved around. I moved out, um, out away from everybody after college. And that was weird for them. Everybody lives kind of in the same little small town, Texas area. And they're not really good at communicating over uh, more distance. So I remember the last few years, um, I kind of started setting my boundaries, if you will, about like what I would eat and how I would conduct myself. And what I would do and almost just kind of was reclusive to my family, like just maintained that role as a, the outsider, you know? And with that, um, I definitely was avoidant a little bit and protecting myself. And then this last year, um, right before Christmas around before Christmas, Thanksgiving time, uh, my grandmother who had raised me, uh, who had been diagnosed with ALS about a year, about a year before that, um, passed away. And this was wild for me. It was a really, really dark time in my life, really challenging time. And I remember going back and thinking, you know, what would, what would I change if I could change anything? Because I had been there and we had had some really great conversations and had a really strong relationship uh, my whole life. She took, she took me in, her and my grandfather did when I was about five years old. So it took me in pretty early in life and, and raised me all the way, you know, through high school. And that was like, that was my home. You know, my grandparents' house was my home. And I was extremely grateful for that. And, you know, my grandfather took on this, this father role in my life and, and was essentially my dad for all practical purposes. <laughs> and, um, and my grandmother was like my mom. And, and I remember I was super into, into health and fitness. Um, and I still am, but especially through my mid twenties and late twenties, it was a huge part of my life. And I remember having to have a conversation with her about food. And she had this old Southern kind of style about her with, uh, with the way that she cooked food. And, and it got to the point where I was just like, I was so self-righteous that I had to say like, you know, I just don't think I can eat the food that you cook anymore. Like I appreciate the effort, but I just don't think I can eat your food. It's just, it's just not, 
It's just not jiving with me. It's not in alignment with my goals or whatever the fuck I was thinking at the time. And then I remember in that reflection after she passed away, you know, if I could do one thing different, if I could do one thing, what would that be? And the, I was taken back in my reflection to that conversation, that conversation. And I remember thinking, I just would have eaten the goddamn food, like whatever she cooked up, whether it was like chicken fried steak and gravy or biscuits and gravy and just dealt with the the gut issues the next couple of days or whatever feeling it made me feel or if I gained half a pound and, you know, went from having two abs to one, like whatever, right? It just wasn't, that was a way that she showed love and appreciation. And I wish that I would have let her show whatever kind of love and appreciation made that made her feel good while I had the chance. And I think that's the case in a lot of families. I think that we go through go through it and we end up kind of resenting the way that our parents show us love because we don't, we don't show love that way. Or maybe it's it's just, it becomes an annoyance for us. And it's not until it's too late to just reflect on the fact that that wasn't about food. It was about affection and, and appreciation. And that's, that was the way that she showed that. And, um, I would have changed that. I would have changed that. And I, and I encourage you guys to, when you go home, maybe reframe the way that you look at the annoying quirks of your family that may seem, may seem a little bit uh, silly now or frustrating now, but you know, when, it, when it's all said and done, those might be the, uh, the things that you end up missing when they're not around anymore. So think about that. You just never know. You never know. I didn't, I didn't think that was going to be, I didn't think two Christmases ago was going to be the last I was going to spend, um, trying to avoid eating <laughs> my grandmother's food for the sake that I might, that I might, um, you know, have the gut rumbles for a couple of days. Um, but if I could change one thing, that would be it. And, and again, it's not about the food. It was about, about the affection shown. And I think we all have our quirks and we all have quirky families and they can drive us crazy at times. And especially when you're stuck in your, in the house you grew up in for a few days. But think about that. Think about the quirks of your family going into the holidays and maybe how you can ask better questions and, and show up a little bit more fully for your family. I know everybody would appreciate that. And I think you would appreciate that too going in. So that's my little bit of a rant about the holidays. There's a lot coming up. Um, but it's a different, it's a different time. So if you're participating in the, uh, in the Black Friday darkness, be careful out there, set your boundaries, maybe smudge yourself with a little bit of sage, light some Palo Santo, and for God's sake, stay out of Walmart. Just do, don't, don't do that. Don't do that to yourself. Don't participate. I don't know any soul that's resilient enough to handle the darkness that happens on Black Friday in a Walmart parking lot. <sighs> Let's get into these hotline calls after a little jam by my boy, Ross Shiflett. Yeah. 
Shiflet from Graham, Texas. Check him out, guys. RossShifletMusic.com. All those links are in the description. We got some hella calls today, guys. We're talking about dating, sex, my challenges with women, and being, you know, on your path, and how kind of what kind of crazy, crazy experiences that can bring you to. So, let's jump into it, guys. First girl we got up is Meredith. Let's see what she's got to say. Hey, Connor. This is Meredith from. Miami Beach, Florida. First of all, when I first heard the voice recording, I thought it was actually you. I didn't realize this was a voicemail. So I started talking and then realized I'm an idiot. Anyways, I've been listening to your podcast for a couple months now. And you come off as a pretty masculine dude with like, you know, a lot of confidence. You seem like you know what you're doing. You seem like you've had a pretty interesting love life. But I kind of want to know what your challenges are emotionally with women and what you think your weaknesses are there and how you could be a little more vulnerable and open up to people a little bit more. If you could touch on that, that'd be great. Also, would kind of like to know your thoughts on moving across the country for a guy, maybe one you've never met. I don't know. Um, Take that where you want it but would love to hear your thoughts. Hope to hear from you soon. Bye. Thanks, Meredith, for calling in. I uh, appreciate that question. Calling me out. We're starting this thing off hot with a fresh call out from Meredith. So, guys, here's the deal. Miami, Miami's a challenge. Let's just cover Miami real quick. That's a challenging place to date. I mean, a lot of money. You got, a, you got one of the Trump houses is there. I mean, I dated a girl from Miami for or West Palm Beach actually, but had those Miami vibes for a while. That's a dangerous game to play, y'all. So say dating Miami is something that I would uh, would not enjoy doing or or really want to jump into, but it's such a beautiful place and a lot of culture, great food. So shouts to Miami for being being a melting pot. Now, Meredith says something about me being uh, (laughs) perceived as pretty masculine and pretty confident. Yeah, um, I would say that perception and reality often often uh, have a little bit of dissonance there. And when it comes to being masculine, yeah, I think I'm, I'm relatively masculine on the scale of things, but I am more flexible than people like to think. Um, actually something that I, that I got into recently in a recent uh, mushroom experience, a very, a very deep mushroom experience was allowing myself to feel helpless and, and be nurtured is something I haven't been really good at in my, in my life. And, and something that I understand now why and how I was, um, kind of guarding myself from that. And he kind of exiled that part of my personality. So, you know, that that's been a challenge. And I think not the challenge that there wasn't a challenge in the sense that I wanted to feel that way. The challenge was that I would attract people and be attracted to people that were emotionally unavailable so that when I needed that nurturing, almost like deep feminine nurturing, um, from someone that it was, it was extremely hard to, to get that. And I would then kind of cycle back to placing that blame on myself and, and was in this really kind of toxic cycle, um, that I've, I've since taken ownership of, but really challenging there. And and one thing that I really love from things like mushroom experiences that you get to, you get to dig into that part of yourself that may need, to be seen and understood in a way that that your kind of self judge and internal self judge won't allow. Um, something really really challenging there sometimes. But 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 that's what the mushroom that's what challenging mushroom experiences are all about. You know, I remember in that one in particular, I was just sobbing, like sobbing for most of the time, and allowing myself to see the first the first moment that I felt completely helpless and how 
how hard that was for me and how I just guarded myself from from feeling more of that experience. So yeah, extremely challenging there. And I think, you know, the thing about dating now and, and being in this the position that I'm in where kind of this outspoken figure for shame exorcisms in a way, um, it, it's an interesting role to play because a lot of times in this in this world, you know, I don't get taken seriously as a suitable partner. And and that's that's there's a lot to do with that. I think a lot of that is a projection of myself and not feeling not feeling super stable. But at the same time, I'm out here trying to trying to do something, and I know that I've had to make a lot of sacrifices along the way to be the type of person that I feel can be successful in what I want to do with my life. And I've it's it's been calculated, but that doesn't mean it's less uh, painful. To be honest with you, you know, I actually was told the other day that I have um, "Don't Take Me Seriously" written all over me, which was funny and true, and also it's kind of like, oh, that's that's not the best feeling in the world. So that's definitely a challenging place for me to be personally. Um, and then yeah, challenges with women is, is something that I've been relatively avoidant, uh, in, in partnership and not that that's necessarily a bad thing. I say, I think that kind of goes, that's par for the course with where I'm at. Um, but I do say that in my relationships that I have, even though they're generally short term and, um, and not super serious. I feel like there's a lot of growth for both people, and that both people have a generally have a good experience. I do have a hard time. Um, I tend to lead people on, even though that's not intentional. Um, but I do tend to put myself, and I've, I've noticed this as of late. Um, kind of putting like it's uh, seeking self validation and, and rationalizing. Um, kind of ignoring someone else's feelings or, or kind of whitewashing what I know and, and kind of in a, in a deep self-rationalizing way. Um, so those are just some of the challenges that I face when it comes to dating. I mean, there's no shortage of, of people to date and, and I enjoy speaking to people and, and randomly walking up to people somewhere. You know, I, I use Bumble as well. Like it's, it's fun to meet people and I really just love connecting with people. And I think sometimes the shadow side of that is that I um, lose focus on one um, for the sake of novelty. So something else, something else there. And then going into moving across the country for a guy. <laughs> well, um, there's a lot that goes into that. You know, I think sometimes when we, when we have distance from someone, we can, again, self, we're self-rationalizing beings. So we can think about this thing as a fairy tale and we tend to want to construct a narrative whenever we have space that we don't understand. We want to construct a narrative that is very uh, po- positive and impactful for us personally, um, even though that may be uh, at, a, at a distance from reality. So when it comes to moving, making bold moves for someone, if that's a part of your personality and you, you're kind of a wanderer by nature, like I think that you're in a way less fragile position, right? You're, you're, you're bouncing around and moving around because you love bouncing around and moving around. And if there happens to be a potential significant other on the other end of your wanderings and fucking hey, that sounds great. But if it's something that there were a lot of expectations placed upon what should happen and will happen when you move there, or go there or, or around that person, you're on a slippery slope to, to fuckery there. And that's something that you got to be really mindful of. I actually had a similar experience to this when I went to um, Toronto recently. So I've been traveling around the country and I was in Toronto for a month and was there seeing a girl that in my perception, in my own reality, where, where, where I had self-rationalized was that I was really open to whatever could be. Like whatever, whatever could be, I wasn't attached to any kind of romanticism. It just, I was just excited to, to meet someone new and, and experience someone new and, and enjoy myself and get out there and play and, and, and uproot my life and, and be around some new types of people and some new types of experiences. But on the other end of that, and what I chose to ignore was that that person had kind of high hopes as to what we would be romantically. And I really disappointed this person, which was not fun. It wasn't a fun experience for me to really disappoint someone. You know, I felt like I, I maintained my boundaries, but I also in reflection look and say, yeah, you, you probably could have handled that better on the front end. And even though you uh, said you were being clear, like maybe you could have been a little bit more clear. Maybe you could have, with the <laughs> without being a complete dick, um, represented yourself a little more genuinely 
through that experience. And that's something that I think about a ton. I think about that a ton um, when I'm thinking about dating is, is what is this person not saying, but what are their actions speaking? And there's a lot of responsibility when someone, when someone has feelings for you, you know, and that's something that I think that, that we overlook sometimes and we make it about us and we don't do the work to develop the connection and develop empathy with one another to, to really show up um, connected, show up with connection and show up in a compassionate way for other people and, and honoring other people's feelings. So to move across the country for someone, there needs to be, in my opinion, a lot of openness to what can happen. That could end up being a badass friendship. That could end up being, it could end up going down in flames and you've got to reconcile and be okay with whatever the fuck is going to happen. So be careful. But also, if you're moving from Miami to maybe like the West Coast, yeah, you're probably going to end up better off because the West Coast is way better than Miami. Uh, East Coast is certified trash, in my opinion. Um, sorry, East Coasters, but that's that's just where I stand. You're probably not going to change my mind. Who Jumping in to the next call from my buddy Colin. Hey, Connor. It's Colin from Canada. Um, something that I'm going through right now that I'm just curious on what your experience is. Uh, so we're all like on the thing where you're changing a lot and your awareness is growing and, you know, you're becoming a different human. I'm just curious on how that has affected your sex life. Um, the reason I ask is because as I'm going changing, it's affecting my sex life. And it's it's kind of interesting to see uh, where that's headed. But I'm just curious on uh, what's going on for you because you've been pretty open about your sexuality. So let's see what you got. Thanks for calling in, brother. Um Colin's a realness OG, man. Colin's been around for a long time. I love this dude. He's such a, such a compassionate guy. I actually call him a, uh, a spirit mechanic. He, he's, he's, a, uh, he's a mechanic up in Canada that also does energy healing. So shouts to Colin for being a super authentic and genuine dude. Now, sex life and can I say like developing awareness? Um, super interesting question, man. And I think that when you become the more empathetic and connected person in a in a relationship even if it's, even if it's purely a a purely sexual relationship i think that you have a responsibility to yourself and the other person you know a lot of times you look at this and you can you can start to see like things about yourself you're developing like a self awareness practice you can see things about yourself and start to notice things about yourself and notice patterns and notice the way that you project yourself onto someone else and notice where you're, what, what itches you're trying to scratch within your psyche by connecting with another person. And maybe you're seeking validation from another person. Like If you're the one that's noticing these things, in my opinion, it's your responsibility to represent yourself well and set the tone for what a relationship, even if it's just sexual, can be. Now I'm talking about in this context, and we'll go into more romantic relationships later, but I'm thinking more in the casual dating scene. Because... When you start to actually be able to show and display and, and embody an empathetic and connected sense of being and, and, and sense of, of bringing yourself to other people, they will be more attracted to you. That's something that is, is more and more rare in our society. So when you can tap into that, you want to be really careful that you're not manipulating and taking advantage of other people and then spiritually bypassing while you're doing it and placing the blame back on them and in these casual connections you have to be able to communicate yourself extremely clearly and you need to be able to listen again like we talked about in the last call listen to what someone's what someone's actions are saying as opposed to what their words are saying super super important now, when you talk about a like a, a more serious or long-term relationship, you know, one you have to be careful that if you're in a committed relationship and there's a lot of shifts going on in your life, that you're not kind of leaving your partner behind unless that's something that you're choosing to do. If you're gonna do that, it needs to be a conscious shift and conscious growth through that process and be able to again communicate that well with your partner because otherwise they're just gonna get him end up getting confused about how you're showing up in the relationship, and that's super challenging as well. So in that, I will say that my sex life has gotten much, much, much better the more aware I am of myself and who I'm bringing and how I'm bringing myself to that sexual relationship. And I think empathy is one of the most underrated things when it comes to when it comes to sexuality. You're really understanding and being able to feel someone else's 
pleasure through you, like this deep kind of oneness through pleasure, which is, is so fun and so exciting. But if you're so caught up in your head and you're, and you're almost like, um, distancing yourself from the situation. This is one of the things that I think the one of the the deep shadows of porn and how much people watch porn and and and, and replicate porn. Like porn is to me an intimacy killer in a way. Now if you're watching it every now and then, if you're watching it every now and then that's fine, right? If you're just getting getting your rocks off once in a while, but if every time every time you need to rub one out, you know, you you're going you're going straight to Pornhub or whatever it is that you love to do. Maybe you're just jumping on Instagram and looking at ass models like you're you're on you're on a dangerous road, my friend, because what that's going to do is 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 disembody you from your in real life sexual experiences. And when you're disembodied from your real life sexual experiences, then you lose connection. Like you lose connection. If someone, if you're pretending to be, or you're, you know, you gotta think you're acquiescing to the things that you put into your life. You're embodying the things that you put into your, into your psyche, into your, into your mind, into your heart space. So if you're going into like porn mode, every time you're trying to fuck, well, dude, you are, you're, you're, you're playing someone else's game. And you can be mediocre at playing your own game, and that's worlds better than being a kick-ass person at playing someone else's game. And you got to think about that when you're going into any kind of sexual encounter and being really connected to someone and taking responsibility for that connection through your practice is only going to be reflected back at you through your sexuality. So those are things to really think about when you're thinking about sexuality and, and then kind of a conscious sexual experience, you know? And what's funny thing is, like, when you get really tapped into what's going on sexually, like I know in my experience, you know, I've, I've, it's, it's been a game changer. Like I don't even, I probably like rub one out myself, maybe like once a week at most, you know, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of, of dialing back on that and making it one of those things that's, that's really rare. And man, that's changed. That's really changed the way that I show up in just my day to day life. Not even in the, not even in the sack, you know what I'm saying? So Something to be thinking about there, but you know, if you're if you're in a in a in a self awareness practice, then I think you have a responsibility to display and represent and embody the connection that you can have through sexuality, and that's how it's impact and impacted my life, you know. And then sometimes you got to think like darkness is sexy, man. Sometimes getting into someone's darkness and playing with your shadows is sexy. I think if you're with someone else who also understands himself well, you can get deep into some shadow play sexually, and that shit is fun as fuck. But if you're doing it unconsciously, it can be really fucking toxic. So be careful with that. I'm a big believer that to be in a real committed relation with, and to be in a really committed relationship with someone, you have to play the same shadow games. And that's, that's a big part of, of the way that I show up in my life. It's like, I, you know, I'm a nice guy and I'm fun and I'm gregarious, but I've got a little darkness in there. I got, I got that shadow. I got that shadow play working inside of me and I like to let that thing dance every now and then. So can your shadow dance with my shadow? And when I say dance, I mean, fuck. So keep that in mind, guys. Keep that in mind. If you're, if you're in a deep in deep in a practice or you're developing a practice, it's only going to help you in every part of your life, right? How you do anything is how you do everything. How you go down on someone is how you shake somebody's hand. You know, it's all the same. Are you there? Are you present? Are you enjoying yourself? Are you creating connections? Are you just playing it, playing a role that you believe you should be playing? Super important to tap into. Next caller, let's move it on. Hey, Connor, it's Lex from Houston. Uh, It's been amazing getting to know the realness community the last few months. Uh, So I definitely look forward to hearing your thoughts on this. I've been living in a constant state of transition the last few years, Um, and now I just sold all my shit and moved down to Houston from Indianapolis and starting a new chapter, uh, which I feel I do pretty often, I guess. Uh, I am freshly 31 now, uh, and I feel really good about where I've been and where I'm going, Uh, but my question concerns the idea of vulnerability surrounding having it all together. It's like as an athlete or professional, you feel you always feel like you have to be on, uh, especially when building a personal brand. You feel like you need to have your shit together. Um, but what I, I've been trying to embrace recently is being open about like the failures and like the process um, and not and not to draw attention, but just to kind of relieve myself of the extra energy it takes to upkeep that facade of perfection. So like how how would you attack being vulnerable about that when you're in a position of like a positive influence? Um, it's not necessarily the conflict of being something you're not, but just allowing yourself to realize things may not be going the way 
they should be kind of based on on your actions and the expected results. Lex, first off, I want to thank you for calling in and thank you for being vulnerable about that because that's that's a really important topic. If you're in, a, you know, in Lex, I know a little bit more about Lex than than she than she shared there. Professional athlete, uh, soccer player, she works with works with kids and is around around a lot of that. And I think that you know, with the, through the context and the experience of athletics, you're always expected to be turned on, right? Mistakes are kind of shunned. You're kind of shamed for making mistakes um, from a lot of coaches. You know, I grew up deep into athletics, especially football. And it was, man, if you, if you fucked up, like you had a, you had a, you had a hand around your face mask and some coach with a big old fat dip in just yelling in your face and maybe calling you a pussy, maybe telling you to get your shit together. And now there's a, there's a part to that. There's just the kind of remember the Titans style of coaching. And, and I don't think that I, I hated that, but at the same time, you know, that was, it may not be the best way. And there's this, this kind of embodiment of expected profession, uh, perfection that can be really, really fucking rough to shake. And one thing that, that helped me move past this was, was the desire to teach from the process, not the destination. And, you know, I think, I think teaching from the journey that you're in is so much more relatable and to be impactful, you have to be relatable to people. You can't just sit on your fucking, on, on the, on the, on the backside of a, of a process or a problem or a struggle or a challenge or, or something like that. And just talk about how great things are now because of the way you handled yourself in the middle of it. I think that is cowardice. I think if you have a real leadership sensibility about you, you're going to share from the middle of the shit. You know, that's something I decided before I even started this podcast was that I have no interest in getting through through a process before sharing about it. And what that means is that I have to reconcile being wrong because in the middle of the process, you're going to be wrong about shit and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to have failures. But if you then embody the way that you share and teach and lead through the process, people don't expect you to be right all the time. But what they expect you to be is honest and compassionate and understanding. And if you can do that and you can say, you know what, that's my mantra. I'm going to teach from the process, not the destination. My journey is where the learning happens and that's where the teaching can happen. You know, you can be a teacher from a place of learning, not a teacher from a place of learn from knowing, you know, then, then you've just, you've, you're, you're, fueling the facade that you have all the fucking answers and that's not that's not necessarily the case i mean even in the lifestyle design program that i run it's i i fully understand that everybody has the answers that they need maybe they need a shift of perspective maybe they need to you know some accountability or just a little bit of direction and maybe you need to be shaken up a little bit and get into some new experiences but i don't have the answers for you i just have i have the resources maybe you know, I have the time to invest into it and I have nothing but the best intentions for you to live your best fucking life. And that's my only agenda for you. But you have the answers. The answers are inside of you. And I think that when you lead from that place, you you really bring in a lot of confidence from the people that you're around and you can embody that. And it takes the pressure off of you. When you have the pressure off of you to be perfect, then you can explore more, you can create more context, you can create a better understanding of yourself. And then it's just this positive feedback loop of leadership that becomes extremely fucking impactful, and is often overlooked. So keep that in mind, teach from the journey, teach from the process, teach from learning, and lead from learning. That's the the, the best leaders I've been around do that. And the ones that I, I don't resonate with are ones that like, oh yeah, that was really challenging, that thing I went through, and here's where I am now, and here's how I handled it. There's a place from that because you're going to get on the other side of challenges eventually. But the willingness to, to throw yourself back in and continue to be in the process and share from the process and not seek that external validation that accomplishing something or being perfect or being right and, and developing self-righteousness, that's that's a slippery slope as well. And you can get caught up in this in this need for that validation of being right because you've been you've been sought out and recognized for it and you've seeked re- and you've and you've achieved relevance through being right or being perfect and that's a dangerous fucking road so you might as well understand that you're going to be wrong share that you're going to be wrong accept that you're going to fuck up and then teach from that place and people will understand that and resonate with that more because everybody's going to fuck up because we're all fucking human beings and that's all good that's the best part. That's the most beautiful part of this thing. 
You know, there's a reason that, that the first noble truth in Buddhism is that suffering exists, <laughs> right? Because it does. There's a point, there's a, there's, a, there's a reason that stood the test of time. So keep that in mind, man. Teach from the journey, baby. That's where the good shit lives. Whew. Get me fired up now, guys. Don't get me fired up on these on these hotlines. Thank you for calling in, Lex. Much love. Thanks for being a part of the Realness community as well. If you want to jump into that Realness community, just go on to Facebook and search the Realness community. Sexy as hell. Good stuff goes on in there, guys. Weekly Facebook Lives. Lots of great engagement. It's a fun time. All right, last call for today. Hey, hey, Connor. Big Will here. Uh, I had an interesting situation here come up. Uh, that's with my, uh, my apartment neighbor on, uh, a bubble here. Uh, curious is that if you've had a situation like that, neighbor or, uh, you know, close proximity living situation, uh, where you've matched somebody on bubble, how, you know, what was your approach? What'd you do? How'd you handle it? All right, buddy. Fucking love it. Keep it up. Big Will, my friend from Twitter. Dude, thank you so much for calling in. Thanks for being so supportive of the show. Now let's 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 just start off here. So Big Will, he matched with his his apartment neighbor on Bumble. Tricky situation. You're, you you've got yourself in a in a tricky situation because you don't really want to ghost out. You've got to acknowledge the connection. You got to acknowledge the match. And we're gonna go into that. But first, I want to talk about dating apps. Let's just let's just put this out there. Tinder is the Walmart of dating apps. Hands down. I mean, it's necessary, probably. It's a necessary evil on the world. But uh, it's not really much where you want to be energetically. Not a great place for you. Now, Bumble, on the other hand, Bumble is the target of dating apps. Very similar. Kind of, kind of the same. They got the same stuff. The same, same things are there. But you're less likely to get assaulted by a hobo in the parking lot. That's all I'm saying. So if you're going to invest your time into a dating app, I highly recommend Bumble. Um... And, you know, it's second to the real world. Definitely don't, don't neglect the real world. Now, you got to think. You match with your neighbor in your apartment complex on Bumble. Again, you've got to acknowledge the match. You've got to say something. And I think one thing you can do here is acknowledge the match in real life. If you see this person in the hallway, be like, hey, I saw that you matched on Bumble. One, that's going to be like, man, this guy's, this guy's got balls. You know, he's, this guy's not scared to, scared to say what he's thinking or, or, or state the obvious, which is, in my opinion, pretty attractive in a man. To be like, hey, you know, hey, we matched on Bumble. Um, do you want to go grab a drink or a coffee? And do the, do, make the match on Bumble, but then ask, for out, ask her out in real life. That's the move, right? I've done that before. I've matched with people on Bumble that I knew in real life or I'd been around or maybe like, they, you know, were like a, somebody that worked at a coffee shop or something like that. And I asked them out in real life. So it's like, if you're going to see this person regularly, ask them out in real life, right? Now, when it's somebody that's in close proximity to you and you match on a dating app and maybe you have a little fling, you know, maybe, maybe you throw it down. Maybe you get a little bit of that, a little bit of that wham, bam in, you know what I'm saying? That, you know, that's good. That may be great, but you got to understand if you get the feels, baby, if you get those feels or if she gets those feels, and it doesn't work out, you're still neighbors. You're still running out that apartment lease. You know what I mean? You may have months, months, potentially years of being neighbors with this person. Now, you got to know if something happens and you start getting a little jealous, maybe you start, maybe something happens and you're not really feeling the vibes or she's not feeling the vibes. She breaks it off. She's not down. She's not down with it anymore. You might have to watch this girl come home drunk at 2 a.m. And, and be with some other dude. You know, you might be hearing it through the walls. You might, you might be hearing some of those, some of those grunts over there. Maybe some animal noises coming through the walls, and that's a dangerous situation to put yourself in, my friend. I mean, if you can handle that, it's a test of resilience for sure. It's a test of communication. It's a test of resilience when you, when you decide to, you know, dip your pen in the company, or the apartment ink or something. I, if you decide to fuck your neighbor, it's a, it's a tricky situation. Let's just put it that way. So. You know, I tread lightly, but I think the move, the first move is if you're going to ask this girl out, you got to do it in real life, man. Don't go knock on her door. Don't go knock on her door. That's weird. Don't leave. Don't be creepy. Don't like leave a note or, or, I mean, you guys aren't in love or anything yet, you know, so I, I would hold off on doing anything too, too out there. But, you know, at worst case scenario, 
you end up, you know, being on the on the other side of a wall of of some girl that you like getting uh, getting digged down by a stranger um, on a regular basis, which is which is a tricky situation in itself. You know, best you know middle case scenario, you've got a you've got you've got a little bit of loving just next door, which is never a bad thing because you know these boys get lonely sometimes. They need a, they need a, they need a little snuggle snuggle, and then um, best case scenario, you end up ha- living happily ever after like a goddamn fairy tale. So. A lot of ways to play here, but I think your first move is to make the first move in real life just by happenstance. You know, maybe you hear her door open and you like happen to go check the mail at the same time, you know, but just don't don't knock on her door. That's not the move. That is by by no means the move. <sighs> Big Will calling in. Yeah, man, that's a tricky situation. Guys, here's the deal. That's all our calls for the day. This is episode one of the hotline. I want you on the hotline. And there's a few ways you can bounce in and say what's up. You can call 800-315-3218 on any kind of phone device. Or even better yet, you can go to my Instagram. That's at Connor Wanders, C-O-N-N-E-R-W-A-N-D-E-R-S. Connor with an E, Wanders with an A. And there's a handy little call button right there on my Instagram. You just hit that call button, and it'll take you right to the hotline. Just hit that on my profile. Wham, bam, you're in. We talk sex, we talk dating, we talk spirituality, we talk mindfulness practices. I mean, you can tell a story, you can just share some love, you can do whatever you need to do on the hotline. You know, be a little weird, don't be too weird, don't get creepy, but I mean, you can be a little creepy too if you want. It's all good. Going into the holidays, guys, share some love, share some love to your friends. Know that a really good smile and a really big hug is better than any fucking gift you can ever give to anybody. Tell your people that you love them. Do your thing. Stay happy. I'm going to play you guys out with a little little jam here, a little ditty from our girl, Whit Blue. Oh, man, I got so many songs here. Let's just play, let's just play Burgundy, baby. Burgundy right now, coming at you from our girl, Whit Blue. Go find her. All the stuff, all the things you need are in the description of the podcast. Get in there. Check it out. Much love. Hugs and kisses. We'll see you all later. Peace. I need to feel right. No autopilot. I'm searching for the high. And always finding it. I'm a thrill seeker. It's nice to meet you while we're here. I'm gonna leave ya. So let's get this shit in gear. Feel